Hey guys, welcome back to yet another episode of the Big Bros Podcast. Today, we will be speaking about traveling and more specifically, traveling abroad in a relationship. I'm joined by my lovely co-host and mate, Jeremy Tussia. Before we get into everything, when I think of traveling, I think of specific AFL journeymen like Tom Hickey or I don't know... I don't know if Garrick Ibbotson fits the bill, but I just think of these AFL journeymen from the <laughs> 2000s. Yeah, no, nah, Garrick Ibbotson, I think he was a one-club champion at the Fremantle Dockers off the halfback flank. Good fantasy player back in the day as well. But the one you mentioned there, Tom Hickey, I think he's the one that comes to mind firstly. Where, where's he played? He's, he's currently at the Sydney Swans. He was on the West Coast list. St. Kilda. St. Kilda. Is there another one? Uh, West Coast, St. Kilda, Sydney. Oh. He's going to do my there's head in. Someone, there's another club that I think we are missing. Wasn't Geelong. It wasn't Geelong. Not sure. But there's another journeyman that comes to mind in my mind. And um, oh, I've just gone blank. He's I've just gone blank. What was his name? Um, I mentioned him before. Jacob Townsend. Oh, Jacob Townsend. That's the one. He started off at the GWS Giants. Then, then went to Richmond. Went to Richmond. Played in a flag, I believe, 2017. I then think so. Was he a top-up player at... The SM, Bombers? No, he was a top-up player in 2020. Then I think he moved or got delisted and went to Gold Coast. Gold not, Coast. Not sure if he got delisted though, but anyways, he's a pretty good journeyman. That's I'd another say. journeyman. Travelling so, all across Australia. <laughs> Travelling all across Australia, these uh, these niche AFL players. So um, that fits the bill for today's podcast because like you said, we're going to be discussing all things travel. Exactly. Travelling whilst in a relationship mm. or whether you should or whether you shouldn't. Um, mm. These are all things we'll dive into. Um, of course. We'll also be speaking about some of our favorite travel experiences. Granted, I haven't done as much traveling as Jeremy has, especially right. in the last few years. But I think it's one of those things that could really be quality over quantity. Mm. So, very excited to get into it. We'll also be speaking about whether traveling is best in a small group, solo travel, big group, or do they all have their own kind of unique benefits? Yeah. And again, we'll obviously touch on some travel dilemmas concerning relationships, but let's get stuck into it. Jeremy, I want to ask you, what has been your favorite travel experience and why? Way to hit me off with a cracker to start with. Well, I've had some incredible experiences. Um, First one being in 2017 for a different reason from my others. 2017 was quite a sentimental travel trip. I went to Poland on this incredible program called the March of the Living. And that was, you know, an educational trip relating to Holocaust education. And that was a really, really eye-opening experience. And one that was probably the first time in my life that changed a lot of my perspectives on the world, um, the way I appreciate certain things, my gratification towards towards people um, and places. And I think that is credited a lot towards being on the program with Holocaust survivors themselves, something we were incredibly fortunate to have with us. Um, I could dive into that. That's a whole nother episode in itself. Um, But that's definitely one that comes to mind as to what was an incredible travel experience for me. 2019, I took a gap year. Um, I went to America, worked on a camp, did Camp America. And that was probably the time where I was a little bit solo in my traveling um, at at moments. Other than that, I've traveled just mainly with friends. Um, Solo traveling, I think, is something that I'm really interested in eventually. Um, But I'm also a big believer in loving to share experiences with other people. I love just being able to turn to someone and saying, how sick is this? Like, look where we are right now. Or or biting into some obscure looking pastry from a random pastry cafe in some fuck off village in Greece or whatever, and just turning to the person next to me and just saying, this is sick. Like that is why I love being with someone um, because you just get get to share those little experiences with them. Um, But solo traveling is something that like, I yeah, I really am interested in in doing eventually because I had a bit of a taste of it in America. Um, well, and, can you tell me a little bit about kind of your, sol- your solo travel in the US? So solo traveling was something that I only did for the first few days in my American experience um, and then at little bits in, of 
the way when I was jumping from destination to destination. So it was a little bit of a taste, but as a 19 year old, when I was fresh out of school and hadn't been away on my own ever before, um, it was something that is really eye opening, even just from the perspective of jumping around place to place, getting a grasp of the logistics of the situation, like taking flights on your own, navigating situations where things might be a bit unfavorable or you might be a little bit rushed for time um, in the airport. I remember there was one time, um, this was like back in back in Europe with, with a good mate of mine, Campbell, shout out Campbell, um, but we were taking a flight from London to Rome and <laughs> the the train we were taking to the airport um, in London completely just stopped along the way to the airport, just stopped. So we had to jump off the train in this random location in Northern London and we had to Uber from there to the airport. Long story short, we did, but we had like 10 minutes to spare before boarding by the time we got there. And I think we dropped our bags within the last like minute of available bag drop. Um, and if we didn't make that, like we would have been stuck in the airport and having to fly out the next day. So, it's- mate, at <laughs> least you made your flight. I remember after school, all of a few group of boys of us, like maybe six, seven of us, we were headed to the lovely Gold Coast for a, not a schoolies trip because a few weeks after all of that mayhem. Yeah, but we went for a nice, you know, little trip down to Gold Coast. We get to the airport and, you know, it's a 6.30 morning flight because, you know, apparently flights are cheaper in the morning. So they say. So they say. Anyways, we're in the Melbourne domestic airport waiting for our Jetstar flight. And, you know, I, I try, to th- try to think that I'm quite conscientious. Like, mm. I, I'm, I'm usually the person that wants to be at the gate AS, ASAP. But for some reason, it's 6.20 in the morning. All of us kind of realise that the flight's about to board. And we're just waiting, chomping down on some Macca's brekkie. And, you know, I keep looking at my phone and I'm thinking, yeah, we should probably head down to the gate. They're probably boarding. Yeah. And there was no, like, sense of panic or urgency. And the consequences of that was we got down to the bloody gate and the person who greets you or rather scans your tickets looks at us. It's like, you guys have missed your flight. Missed. Missed our flight. They're like, we've been announcing all of your names, six, seven of you, all over the loudspeakers and you can't, you have clearly didn't hear. Really? So all of us look at each other. Have, have I not told no. you this? This is one of the most embarrassing stories. And I remember we look at each other and we think we are the biggest idiots. We felt like the biggest morons. And <laughs> And it, this was what, four? Yeah, this would have been literally as soon as we finished school. So we were all 18 at the time. And we look at each other and the first <laughs> response we have, because we are literally still kids, we cannot tell our parents. <laughs> they cannot find out that we just missed our fucking flight. Yeah. <laughs> so I immediately think, okay, like it's a domestic trip to the Gold Coast. I'm sure there's going to be other flights. Yeah. So I'm sure... Th- it was just a matter of getting onto the next flight, mm. but it was two things. It was also having to pay the transfer fee on another flight, but it was also just the principle. Like, you missed your flight. I've never missed a flight. Yeah. I'm always, like, I, I was so angry at myself. So, that started off as a bit of a meme. Yeah. And that's probably been the only time, that has only that, that has been the only time I have missed a flight. But, yeah, look, after that, it's just one of those things you can reflect on. Yeah. You're with your group of mates it's and a learning experience. It was such a learning experience. And so now, like, any time I am traveling, whether it's domestic or even internationally, like, my girlfriend and I were always at the gate on, like... Early. We, we literally set up camp if we have to, just to, to avoid that. Yeah. One thing, though, I think with, <laughs> with boarding, people think, like, as soon as they announce boarding, right, let's jump up and jump in line. The plane is not going to go anywhere without you. If you're in the gate area for boarding, like be the last person to board the flight why would you want to be standing in that line (laughs) sitting on the tarmac for 20 minutes you actually sound like my dad and my mum. actually every time we'd go on a holiday when i was younger i would actually get the biggest anxiety traveling with them just because they would be sitting like going to the bathroom as soon as they're announcing people and i'm just like let's get in line let's get in line and my parents like why why do you want to you know wait in line like a sardine why do you want to wait in line like a sardine and it's just like i just want to be on the plane already i just want to be on there so they don't leave yeah it's the anticipation of it all and anticipation is something we absolutely love as humans which is why we decided to do this episode now because 
We what are we in? We're in May. It's the start of May when this episode is is uh being released. Um, and everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people. I'm not. You're not. I I might be. I don't have but, time. Um, a, a lot of people are now looking at a traveling mid year, a bit of Euro summer potentially. Um, and it's a great opportunity that if you are a uni student to be able to jump on a plane if you've got like four weeks off from uni and see the world, see the world with your mates, see the world solo. So let's get stuck into some of the nitty gritties of, um, you know, traveling, especially during the middle of the year um, and what to expect because it's a whole, it's a whole different ball game over there, especially in Europe at this time of the year. We're coming from the pits of Melbourne where it's like absolutely shocking weather at the best of times we've had a decent run recently but it'll be a bit grim soon and you're going to land in europe wherever you are if you you know if that's if that is you and you do choose to travel um and it's just going to be completely eye-opening for for many many reasons so ilan when you went away on your gap year that was with a big group of people right uh, yeah, it was with a decent group of people. What, although it wasn't a gap year, is what essentially what you mentioned. Just it's a just, uni break travel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know, it's funny because you you go away in July, and I think when you're 19 and you actually haven't had like this sort of travel experience before, you're just expecting that the only people you're you will be around is other Europeans. Mm. But you soon realise that everyone from Australia decides to book their travel at the exact same time, whether it be for uni, school break, whatever, whenever they get time off work. Yeah. And it's always in July. So you're in Mykonos, you're in Berlin, you're in Amsterdam, as was in my case. And every second person there felt like an Aussie. Yeah. So I reckon as, as that's like, that was the first thing where I was like, okay, it doesn't feel that unique. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing. You know, you love running into fellow Aussies. It's great. Yeah. But it's like, that's the one realization you have is you see how many Aussies are there at the exact same time. You also realize, at least I did, I started thinking about, do I book budget airlines like Scoot in the future? Because me, do you book, do <laughs> you book budget? Me. Cause I, I was like, you know, you're in uni, you don't have a whole life savings to dedicate to a nice travel trip. So you're going to try and cut some corners. You're going to try and fly Ryanair. You're going to try and fly Scoot. Essentially, they're versions of Jetstar. Yeah. And just, you know, being prepared that you're not going to have some Emirates A380 first class experience flying from Dubai to London. <laughs> Look, I think it depends also on, on the availability of your flights. Because when I went away last year... Um, my flight to where we, we flew into Greece from Melbourne and the only reasonably priced flight um, was actually via Scoot and it was the one stopover and it was Scoot both ways and yeah, look, it is quite budget um, but I think Scoot. for affordability and for value for money, maybe bring your own food on the plane, bring a bit of Burger King on the plane or something. Which, I, th- which I think <laughs> brings up... there in one piece. And I think actually brings up a valuable point as well is when you're young and you don't have that much money to dedicate on, you know, luxurious travel, embrace flying low budget, embrace staying at places that you may not necessarily be used to or be used to. Like, it doesn't have to be a five-star. It could be an Airbnb. It could be an apartment. It could be a hostel. In fact, hostels... I remember the only time I stayed in a hostel... I actually didn't like it that much, mm. but I'm glad I had that experience mm-hmm. because for me personally, it, I wanted to experience that element of traveling. Remember, I said it was quality over quantity. I haven't had that many experiences where I've stayed like in hostels and whatnot, but that one experience was like really marked for me. It was in Amsterdam and I thought it's like, if I'm going to do the whole like I'm traveling Europe sort of thing, I may as well do it right and stay in a bloody hostel. But you asked me a bit earlier like how that trip was. It was really good fun. It yeah. was it was great, and I'd love to definitely return back after I finish studying. It's just quite a busy year for myself, so maybe I'll take yeah, some time next all, year. It's all in good time. But and your twenties is such an integral time to travel, yeah. and you know, whilst you're not married, whilst you don't have kids, potentially you don't even have you're not locked down by a full time job. Mm. Having that ability to just go away for a few weeks, even a couple months, even to exchange if you can through uni. Unfortunately, I didn't get that opportunity. But I've had friends who have done exchange and they have all loved it. Yeah. Oh, it looks like an incredible opportunity. Not something that I was able to do as well myself for physio, but traveling mid-year has been something that I've always just tried to take in my stride because you know you don't know when those opportunities are going to come around. And 
I know money is always a factor, but I've always been a big believer as well that money is there to be spent. Um, and when you do eventually start your full-time work, that's when you'll probably be a little bit more comfortable with your money and the the pennies that you're making whilst you're working during uni. I've This is just my personal belief. I've always been a big believer that that should be put towards something like traveling because you don't know when you're going to get like four weeks off um, in the middle of the, the year to be able to go to some Spanish beaches on the other side of the world. Um, but obviously everyone's situation is different. Some people might want to save up for, for for moving out or for getting a new car or whatever it may be. But that's just always been my personal experience. And you mentioned before staying in hostels. That's not something that I've actually ever really done, just stayed in a in a public room hostel. But something that I think is a fantastic option if you are traveling solo, great way to meet people. But people also often think that you know, if you want to do Europe like pretty cheap, pretty low budget, you just got to stay in hostels. But with my experiences, you're able to stay in some pretty decent hotels or Airbnbs, which are your private rooms, your private spaces for very affordable prices, maybe slightly more than staying in a public room hostel. But me personally, I, I just like my own space. I like to call myself a bit of an extroverted introvert. You know, we like to be around energy, but I also love my own space so if you're prepared to pay like an extra 20 bucks australian a night 15 bucks australian a night potentially you can definitely have your own space in an airbnb or private room hostel do you want to know what my turning point was in this hostel i don't know if we're going to edit this out but i think we may as well say the story <laughs> i was i was sick because i i was i was completely out of it because i had come straight from mykonos yeah to amsterdam yeah. and I was really, really sick. I think four days of partying is going to take a toll on your immunity. And I just needed like a f- four, five, six hours just to relax, just to kind of get my bearings so I could enjoy the rest of my tri- uh, rest of my time in Amsterdam. As I'm lying there, it's, you know, it's a shared room. There's this British lad, maybe in his 30s, comes in with his uh, lady... fucking going. Pretty much with his lady friend who isn't actually staying in the shared room. And then he proceeds to go up to the top bunk and I'm just thinking like, like, nah, surely not. Above you. Above me. <laughs> surely not. Surely not. And then saved by the bell, the hostel manager actually comes into the room and says, mate, you two need to get out. You haven't been paying for your room. Oh, and no. she hasn't, she's, she's not welcome here. She's not a guest. Both of you out. As soon as they leave, he's like to me, yeah, it's like, and we both know what they were trying to do yeah. and I'm like thinking fuck I'm so happy I would have oh. I would have literally left I would have said something but it was that was probably when the penny dropped for me so I got up <laughs> I was incredibly sick I decided to just get my clothes on and and run run walk run started down walking Vondel down Park. bloody hell <laughs> I needed some fresh air got some shroom and waffles and just bloody <laughs> sat on the grass and just reflected on that experience and <laughs> Gee, that was that was a good turning point. There but you go. It's little experiences like that when you have when you travel that you kind of just you come home and then you reflect upon and you think, wow, like it wasn't necessarily the necessarily the sightseeing or all the things that you see on the postcards, but it's the funny meme experiences that you have yeah, on the, the day little, to day. Yeah. Like it's arguing with your friends when you're sitting at a bar, you're getting pissed drunk on German beer. It's 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 those experiences. But the reality is a lot of people will say like, you know, one of our friends, shout out to Sterling, he said to me, like, if you two if you two have an episode about traveling, you two have probably the most vanilla experiences with traveling. It's probably it, it resembles everyone else's travel experiences. And he's actually right, because as I said, every Aussie goes to Europe, every Aussie goes and travels and parties it up in your in Euro summer. So he's right about that. But I do think there's those little experiences that differ from person to person that make those experiences special. In my case, it was clearly it was clearly that gentleman getting escorted out of the <laughs> hostel. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is all very different. And it, um, every place, every continent provides a different story for sure. So that's what, I mean, I felt as well, like not only in, in Europe, but in America. So um, that's a whole nother can of worms. And I'm sure we'll dive into that in another in another episode, just talking about gap year traveling. But um, it's obviously a time period as well where like, you know, we're in our 20s. We start to open up the opportunity of potentially 
having a partner or being in a relationship with someone. So how to balance being in a relationship whilst being a traveler, if you do want to do both of those things, that can be something that can um, play on a lot of people's minds. So do you first and foremost think that like you can travel overseas whilst in a relationship if your partner isn't present there with you? Fuck oath. Of course you can. And you should. Time away is one of the best things you can do for a relationship. I'm not saying time away where it full on turns into like a long distance relationship. But the reality is, as I said earlier, your 20s is going to be marked by a lot of new experiences and traveling should Mm. be one of those experiences because it builds you up as a person. A relationship should never hold you back from traveling or doing things that you truly want to enjoy because the consequence of that is you may start to resent the other person or you resent yourself for not ever having that experience because one day you won't have the ability to travel. You might be tied down with a job that you can't leave, as we said, or you might have a family and kids and whilst you might love them, you might have that lingering thought in your head, gee, I really wish I got my traveling out of the way. With regards to a relationship though, you know, I try and travel with your partner if you get that chance as well. That's always a lot of fun. Great kind of team building, great relationship building experiences of going away with them. I've done it a few times with my girlfriend and it's been great. But also if you can't travel with them, just to answer your question, there's nothing wrong with going away. It's not like you have to break up with them. Every, look, some couples might decide to go on a break if it's like one's going on exchange. They might break up completely. Me personally, I could never do a break. But it, again, it's person to person. But to answer, it just back to that initial point of course you should be able to travel yeah mate i totally agree with you um i think that you should definitely encourage your partner to to go and travel and and see the world because you can come back with new insights new perspectives um and i think it's it's a really beautiful thing if if you know you're lucky to to have that person by your side that encourages you to to chase your goals and chase your dreams and if one of them is traveling Go and do it. You, you don't want to hold yourself back. And I think if you, if you find yourself in a situation where potentially your partner might not be happy with you going away without them, oh, I don't know, maybe I think questions might need to be asked within each other about why. Like, wh- why do you not feel comfortable with me going away? Is it coming from a place of you think that I might be a little bit unfaithful? Is it coming from a place of you you just want to experience it with me? Every situation is different, but I think that, you know, like you said, I've always been a big believer in chasing the opportunity and and not letting anything get in your way. Um, And also, if you're going away with the intention of wanting to be purely single whilst going away, look, to each to their own, However, I think it's also like, for example, going on a night out in Melbourne with the intention of purely trying to get with someone in a club, for example. If that's your pure intention and that doesn't come to fruition, would you feel fulfilled about your trip or about your experience? Maybe, maybe not. That's That's up to you to decide. But I think if that's your intention for going away, I think you're already putting a lot of doubt on your travel experience because if things don't go the way you plan it to go, you might not be happy with your takeaways. Well, yeah, I I suppose that most kind of questions around whether you'd be comfortable with your partner traveling, I think most people would be fine with it. I think where the topic becomes a little bit more blurred is if you ask your friends or someone, would you be comfortable with your partner going to a travel, like to a party hotspot, Mm. like a Mykonos, like a... Ibiza, any sort of those environments where you're in a clubbing, partying, drinking environment where people are kind of mingling with one another. And the reality is like you hear stories where people go on exchange and you hear that people come on exchange and they already have a partner. Mm. They leave exchange without a partner because some sort of infidelity occurred. So automatically you hear other people's stories and you start thinking, well, holy shit, that might actually happen in my relationship. So that begs the question, do you think it's appropriate if you're in a relationship for your partner to go to a party destination? I think like, I think it comes back to the same point. I think, yeah, I mean, partying and experiencing clubs and, and nightlife and, and music acts and festival is such a key element of traveling. It's it's some of my most memorable experiences from being away. It's It's been unbelievable. And 
I like me personally, I'd feel comfortable um, if you know I was in a relationship and my partner wanted to do that because I think it comes back down to your core elements of of trust and honesty and communication in your relationship with that person. If if that's down pat and you guys are generally quite open with one another, quite comfortable with one another, I think you should feel free with encouraging your partner to to do that and to do whatever they want because you know we're we're young we're in our 20s if you we like our music we like our, our you know we like DJs we we like all that stuff um so that you shouldn't hold back someone if that's what they want to do and i think if you're holding back someone from from doing that you need to ask yourself is that fair on on my behalf is that a little bit selfish for me to to hold someone back from from chasing an experience mm. Well, yeah, I suppose you can't ever hold someone back. I do agree with you. It's a, it's very true. I suppose there's another element to it, which is you don't necessarily need the travel experience to reveal whether a person is going to commit some sort of betrayal or infidelity. As 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 I said like a couple of weeks ago, that sort of thing stems from the person. So they could do it back at home. It doesn't necessarily need to happen when you're away. So like for me, from what I spoke about from the kind of episode a couple of weeks ago, I would have been more hesitant to be in a relationship with someone and feel like I wouldn't be that comfortable with them going away to those party destinations. But then you'd have to remind yourself that it has nothing to do with the environment itself. It can just reveal it. Yeah. But it, if, if, if they've got it within them to commit such like betrayal, it's going to happen irrespective of the traveling or not. And you'd probably pick up on those cues before the traveling even happens as well. And I think, Potentially, but... It, I think, well, I think communication is the big one. If the mm. communication seems a little bit iffy, if they seem a little bit disjointed with their, their honesty in terms of, you know, what they expect to experience when going away or even what they're experiencing here in, in you know, where, where you are in the world with them right now. Like, if it's a little bit disjointed with communication... You're probably picking up on cues already. Yeah, and look, disjointed communication is another big one. Look, for anyone, any of our listeners who have been in like a situation like that where their partner's gone away and you could have the strongest relationship full of trust, it might be a few hours where they haven't responded and they might be a prompt, you know, they they respond quite promptly in general, but they, they've gone a few hours, they're in a bar, they're in a club, whatever. You could just start having, you know, these what if thoughts, intrusive thoughts that aren't necessarily even reflective of reality. And I think what can get to people is that thought that of what if, as I just said, but there's no way to verify it because Mm. even if your partner did do something hypothetically that would undermine and disrespect the relationship, Mm. it's hard because you might may not ever find out. And Mm. I think that's why it can really test the foundations of a relationship. But that's mm. not to say you don't let your partner do that. You you should, in fact, let them go away. Mm. Because at the end of the day, what you're going to do is end up enabling them to resent you. Yeah. And that's the last thing you want to do. You, you want to have equal standards for the both of you. You want to, you know, fair game. They want to go travel. You can go travel and do the same thing. But I think it's also worth communicating how to navigate the potential challenges that come about. It might be worth saying, hey, look, I know the time spent speaking to each other is going to be limited. After all, you want to explore and have the best time that you can. You can always, you know, specify specific hours of the day where you can speak, whether it's the morning or evening. If you can't do that, maybe a text, at least a good night, a good, uh, good morning text, things like that can actually also help in the long run and help kind of mitigate some of those challenges. If you are traveling and your partner's like in a, like a, party destination or just like any travel destination yeah so it's more so just about setting those those boundaries and um well not so much boundaries but but setting well it is boundaries but it's 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 having these kind also of the expectations setting expectations sure. for one another so correct but the last thing you want to do and it's it's tempting because if you've got insecurities it's very easy to then put them onto the other person. And when mm. you put them onto the other person, you kind of avoid yourself of the responsibility when in fact it might just be a reflection of how you feel. Yeah. If you have standards and expectations of what you two may feel is respectable in a relationship context, you mm. know, these could be like, yeah, I know you're not going to get with someone if you meet them. I know you're not going to cheat on me. But like, for example, if you're with your single friends, would you go and you meet a 
group of single guys or you go back to theirs. That's like, you know, that's different for every relationship. And there's no wrong or right answer. It's whatever you, the couple deems as respectable or disrespectful. Yeah. But I think it's those conversations that are really, really helpful, like preempting the possibility so that when something does, something like that does happen, the person back home or the person overseas isn't going to feel shocked by yeah. it any sort of scenario that does pop up. Exactly. So, they preempting those things. Preempting those things, knowing what to expect and communicating those things. I think it really just comes down to the nitty gritties of that, having the good open communication, trust and honesty with one another. And, you know, if, if you can nail those things and you can encourage the partner to, to, to go and experience whatever it is they want to experience, mm. I think you, you should find a li- quite a bit of comfort in, in each other with those experiences. I agree. And like, look, just to emphasize again, the reason, like some might ask, why are we touching specifically on this area when it comes to traveling? And, you know, I think the last few years we've seen our friends who've been in relationships go away and have their partners also go away. And it's such a f- topical issue. And it, I yeah, don't know, I don't know if it's spoken about. 20s. I don't even know if it's spoken about that much in fairness. So I, I think so. I thought it's something good to kind of have that perspective, especially if we have younger listeners, 16, 17, who, you know, in the next few years, they might want to go travel. Of course mm. you want to go travel. Most people do. It's, it's a great experience. But if you don't, that's fine as well. But you might also want to be in a relationship and having that thought of how do I balance one with the other can really, really be a challenging thing. Jeremy, quick fire question. Expedia or individual airline booking? Individual airline. Who goes on Expedia? Me. Really? Yeah. It's really? Not, it's not bad. Expedia is pretty good. Yeah. It's like flight center as well. Going Expedia, to a, yeah. Going to a travel agent or just doing it yourself. Yeah. No, I think Expedia is pretty good. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I've always, I've always had luck just um, using Momondo. Mo- Momondo. Momondo. Yeah. I think I've heard of it. It, it just kind of weighs up all, all your different options. It's nice nicely aesthetically panned out on the website it all looks nice and pretty what's um, your airbnb uh rating oh god that i can't tell you probably good i'm a i'm a, I'm a good tenant uh, tenant no that's the that's the opposite you're a good I'm a guest good, i'm a good guest good resident you should swim from gibraltar to morocco given the close geographical proximity yes and i heard uh <laughs> Funny you mentioned that because I was watching a video the other day about Gibraltar and I think they actually have quite a prevalent uh, number of trees there that grow dates. And uh, I love dates. <laughs> so maybe I should go to Gibraltar and eat some dates. All right, guys, on that note, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our lovely listeners who have kept tuning in, kept rating the show five stars, although I think you may only be able to do it once, but... Still, the engagement's been great. The likes on the Instagram, all of your support's been really, really appreciated. And yeah, that's pretty much us done for this episode. We hope that you all have a lovely rest of your Tuesdays or the rest of your week. And Jeremy, any final thoughts? Final thoughts is uh, travel and take your opportunity to travel because it's the best thing in the world. It's the best thing for your personal development. Um, don't let anything hold you back. Um, and, and Expedia. Expedia tends to be helpful with those Expedia. things. Expedia is very good. Momondo for me. Fair. <laughs> Have a good week, guys, and we'll see you in the next one. See ya. Bye.